today's title was uh, best practices for management database and as Lyle and I were together and we were writing it kind of just morphed into this um, you know mostly from our experiences with with support and just things that we have seen in clients databases um, you know after dealing with hundreds of clients uh, over many years um, we kind of just put together our list of things that we see that are most common and uh, hopefully we'll give you some ways to avoid them also so let's get to it number five too many databases i know some of you can relate to this uh, i've seen a whole lot of this that we uh, having some issue with somebody's database or they, they got a support issue and and we, we make a, a change and it's not affecting this one guy over in the corner because he's hooked to a different database than everyone else and uh, we jump on the uh, we jump on their server and see that they got a bunch of databases This can cause all kinds of issues um, and make managing the database a complete nightmare. Um, we also we also see companies that run multiple databases on purpose. Um, depending on your reasons, that could be a good idea or could be a bad idea. Um, but bottom line, most of the time, it's going to cost extra extra time in just managing the database. Right, and I'll add to, to this as well, um, you know, to avoid some of these things, common problems with databases would be uh, creating user permissions. So as a support rep, I, I see that as well, that we see a lot of people have full rights and um, somebody, or even uh, Windows, permissions. Uh, somebody, before they leave, they copy the entire database from the server to their local machine without letting anybody know. And before you know it, I'm getting a call saying they're having a problem, but it's not the standard. And because they inadvertently or purposely copied it down locally, and now they're running it separate from the server. The number four, substandard items. So what I what we also see here um, is if you look, uh, I went ahead and downloaded some content from a manufacturer's website that has uh, ITM content. So if you look at the first image up at the top, you'll see uh, a native item, CID 868, which is a common CID pattern for the valves, and next to it is the same exact valve from the manufacturer's website, CID 1175. You'll notice that the size difference is a lot bigger. So um, this is another thing. We see bloated models. We see bloated databases with just a ton of converted items where if you can use standard items, native items, that's going to save you a lot, of, a lot of headache, as well as when you download uh, content from unknown sources or even known sources, you'll see in the uh, bill of materials there, it's missing some of the product information. Um, as we have seen in the past couple years, uh, product information really, there's a lot of benefits to making sure that you have your product information filled out properly, as well as if you're utilizing SDMEP, um, you'll notice too that this content came in without any of the costing data. Um, so whether or not you're using S now or wanting to implement it in the future, these are all things that you wanna keep in mind when you're bringing in content. Um, another uh, it, problem with the unknown sources, incorrect dimensional data. Um, so if you're downloading this from unknown sources, again, if you're not checking it, you know, if, if it's incorrect, that's gonna come back to bite you. Um, and there's ways that we can avoid a lot of this, uh, especially like for the missing product information. If you have a simple Excel sheet, what I find is um, 
fill out a lot of that information in there and we can easily copy and paste it. Uh, ITMs, if you're down, needing ITM content, uh, there's proper ways to build it. There's uh, many uh, content resources out there that you can, um, you know, that are, are well known within the industry. Um, and as well as, as you can see here, use native CIDs where you can. Uh, converted items typically, what, you know, are going to be items that are, you're not going to have a lot of them in the model, um, but things as elbows, valves, straights, we want those type of fittings uh, as a native pattern. Another problem we see with uh, with items is connector mismatches, uh, especially if you're you're mixing things from from one ecosystem to another. That uh, then you get the pop-ups saying these connectors don't match. Number three, duplicates. There probably isn't a database out there who hasn't experienced this. Uh, you go in and you see things like you see on my screen here. I got a flange half inch and a flange half inch. Um, the problem with these are when you go to apply one to an item, which one do you pick? And what's the difference? And the amount of time you spend trying to figure out which one to use. And then you'll decide, okay, I want this one. And, and, and let's just get rid of this other one. But the problem is that someone's already used it and attached it to an item. And if it's attached to an item, the next time they use that item, this, this connector that you deleted will just come back. And uh, I can guarantee you that every one of you database managers have experienced this. Uh, duplicate services, duplicate connectors, materials, pretty much everything in the database. Uh, there seems to be no area that this is not affected. Yeah, I was just going to say on the duplicate materials, you know, I ran across this last week. Uh, you know, if you're using the change spec command to change the specification on your items, well, the if you have the material and it may be galvanized and it's in that spec, but you try to go do a change spec and you don't see anything to be able to change it from, well, sure enough, there was two materials named galvanized. One was version different, one wasn't. So, again, it's just when trying to use normal commands, functionalities within the program. This stuff really will start to hinder uh, the the way it works and uh, throughout the program. There's a couple ways to avoid this kind of stuff. One of them is, whenever possible, try not to rename things. Uh, renaming will cause this. You come in and rename a connector. Well, the next time uh, somebody selects an item that had that old connector name, well, the old connector name comes back in. Uh, in this instance right here, where we got one with tick marks and one without, uh, it could have been that somebody was running a script and they found out those tick marks could cause them some issues when running scripts. So they go through and remove all the tick marks. Um, but something else in the database brought that the old name back in and now we have duplicates. So renaming it, avoiding renaming when whenever you can uh, can help you avoid this issue. Uh, another thing is just knowing if you are going to rename how to rename. Um, things I've done in the past are if I change a name then create a script to then go through your database and roll through that whole thing and change any parts that have the old one to, to the new name. Um, there, were, there were lots of, of little tricks for getting those done, too many for us to even cover in, in this short thing. Um, so renaming is, is, avoiding renames is one way to avoid this. Uh, another one is, again, this permissions thing. Uh, we never want to go into our master database or the database on our server, the main database that everybody uh, eventually works out of, and open drawings, especially drawings from outside sources, um, because they're going to have their own materials connectors that may have similar names to ours and sometimes even identical to where we'll see identical names in here. The software does allow for that. Um, 
And so it gets really tough to figure out which one to use when you have identical ones. But a lot of that can be avoided by never opening, um, never opening a drawing when you've got full permissions. Use your full permissions just to make changes to your database. Don't open old drawings where it may have old uh, connector names and old material names. And absolutely never open a drawing from an outside source in your master database. Um, following those guidelines will cut down on your amount of duplicates drastically. And then I'll add to that as well, going back to number five, too many databases, you know, somebody created an item in their local database and they take that, you know, they go into Windows, copy the item, dump it into, uh, into the master database or the main database, uh, well, you know, again, like Scott was saying, those items are carrying a lot of information. And so that's uh, one way to, to avoid bringing over that unduplicate information. Duplicate. Uh, did we just go over one? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Unused data. So unused data, um, a lot of times what I'll see is... Go ahead to the next line. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so services, right? So you'll have a bunch of unused services, service templates, sections, reports, job specific uh, information, um, temporary data. Um, so I just took some just screenshots to get it all on, on the one page here. So on the first one you see over here on the left, I just went in and you can easily see in your service uh, editor when you're editing your service templates, what templates aren't assigned to a service? While this, these service templates could be um, used for other services, you can also look to see, did I copy one? Are there duplicates? So there's ways to come in here and see fa fairly quickly if I've got some stuff in here that's not tied to a service or if I've created duplicates and need to get rid of them. Another one, reports. It never fails that, uh, somebody's having a reporting issue and it turns out that they've made a copy of that report and you'll notice that if you don't rename the report it just comes in as untitled well it may not be in, or you may name the report name but not save it properly so then the file name when you go into your database uh, you could have a bunch of duplicates or untitled reports that aren't needed and again you know the let the more options you have the more room for user error um, same thing with temporary data, as Scott was saying, if you open up a drawing and you see a lot of that bracketed information, depending on how you open that drawing, whether or not you're in as full, whether you hit yes, whether you hit no, this information, uh, it will be in there so you know where it's coming from. But at the same time, we want to make sure that that temporary data is not injecting itself into the database. And then there's ways around it too. So if I imported a service, I may want to make some of that information permanent. So again, going back to purging and uh, cleaning up the database part of it, you can come in here and make sure you keep a lot of this stuff clean. Profiles, if you're not using profiles, um, again, your, your global profile, you'll have a, a list of services. You want to make sure that your, as soon as the job is done, uh, export those out, archive it, remove that information out of the database, because as you know, this thing is a living organism and it just gets bigger and bigger over time. And um, we can reduce a lot of that stress or, or file size if, if we can. You know, bottom line is duplicates just waste time. They waste the uh, database manager's time in, in dealing with it. Uh, they waste our, our detailers and our uh, estimators and our cam guys time just sifting through all the data to to get to what they want um keeping it clean keeping those duplicates to a minimum uh, will make everybody more productive now as we were putting this together and, and you know we all didn't agree on on the order of these. In fact, when I finished the order and, and got all the slides together, um, 
you know, one of the suggestions that Lyle had was he thought that multiple databases was was number one. That was the worst one. And, and I had it at number five. After I hung up with him, I thought, you know what? I can't fix any of these other problems until I fix multiple databases. So if I take it in that regard, multiple databases would probably be number one um, because there's no use going in and cleaning up uh, duplicates and all these other things in multiple databases and then try to get down to one database. Um, so with that being said, we got number one, broken services. The reason I push this to number one, because if you got broken services, it, it, it just makes it nearly impossible to draw with. Um, and there are lots of issues that, that would that I would say that that service is broken. Um, if you've been if you've been using this program for any time at all, you may have seen these green crosses, um, and they happen for a couple different reasons: either the item's missing or, or the image is missing, one or the other. Um, and this comes from again uh, back to the renaming thing. You go in to rename an item, it breaks all the buttons with that item. Um, so, you know, avoid renaming when possible again, but can you rename and do it correctly? Yes, you can, but there is a process. In fact, uh, at some point we're going to, and I don't know where, I, where we're going to throw them in, but I have a bunch of links. Um, one of them is on the proper way to rename. Uh, I did a blog post that and you can find those blogs on asti.com and talking about the path repair tool. So if you're going to rename things, I walk through the steps, the proper way to rename an item so we don't break our services. Uh, other problems I see with services, um, button mappings. Uh, too many times we've got people in there building services that don't fully understand how button mappings and, and uh, button codes work. Uh, we, we need to understand those if we're going to maintain operating services. Um, now, of course, if you're not using Design Line, it really doesn't matter. But the problem you will have is that when that time comes that someone in your department or or um, someone in the company wants to start using design line, well, they can't. Um, and it becomes impossible for them even to learn to use that tool if things aren't set up properly. Um, other things, other problems we'll see is, I hate when I look, one of my pet peeves, I look at a service and there's 50 buttons on it. Um, it makes the buttons go smaller. You, you've all noticed that, that uh, you resize that the service and it's going to make all the buttons fit so they get smaller till I can't recognize them. And honestly exposes a lot of parts that I may not even want the guys using on this particular job. Um, there's a couple ways we can avoid too many buttons. One, I, I try to stick with just common everyday items and then make sure that our users know if they, you know, if they're allowed to know how to get to uh, the folders interface so they can drag something out of folders for those non-standard items. Um, uh, another way to control that is through profiles. If you're building job specific profiles, kind of solve some of this too, because we can put only the buttons that apply to that project and make them very specific to that project. And profiles are, are almost my number one thing for keeping a database clean, keeping all that job information where it belongs in its own sandbox under a, a job specific uh, profile. Another thing that I'll see is naming convention, uh, that there's no standard, that things jump around, making it tough for users to find the services that they need. 
once you have a mature database, you're going to end up with a whole lot of services. And if you don't sit down and think about how you want them all named so that you have a standard, you're going to make it very tough on your users when it comes to choosing services. Um, and I would avoid unnecessary abbreviations. I'll see um, services where the service name is abbreviated. We have a spot for an abbreviation that we can pull in reports and all of that. So I try not to use abbreviations or overuse abbreviations in my service names. Um, it will help when you add new people you got um, that get added to the department. And if you have to go through and explain what a service is and what those abbreviations are, then they're not very good abbreviations and they will just slow down the process. Um, I ran into it with, with training that uh, I did a little experiments. I had, I had a bunch of services that were used abbreviations for names and I would tell the whole class to, to go draw with this certain service and week after week, at least three out of 10 would be drawing with the wrong service. Um, I changed it and put in the full name of the service and got rid of the abbreviations. And from then on, I didn't have a single student drawing with the wrong service. So avoiding overuse of abbreviations can just solve, can just save you time and prevent mistakes. Well, and two, we also need, now that we can bring these services into Revit, um, you know, going back to even those converted items and placing items and building your services, that has to be taken into consideration as well on how this stuff is going to live inside of Revit. Right. So that's our top five things. Um, there are a lot more, and I know you all have seen uh, see more e either in yours or, or other people's databases. Um, All right. So are we ready for questions then? Absolutely. All right. We do have a gentleman that would like to know, what about having a different database for duct and one for pipe? You know, that's probably the most common thing I hear about multiple databases. And honest, you know, I used to in the beginning say, no, just please don't do that. And over time, I've kind of changed my philosophy on that because, you know, knowing all three of the programs, CAM, EST, and CAD, really the only duplicate labor you would have in that is some of the ancillaries. Those are the only real things that we share between piping and ductwork. Um, so you are going to have a little extra time in that. Um, okay. But that's that's about the only thing. So if a company really wants to do it, I, I still would recommend that it be in one. But I, it's not as big a deal as I, as I thought it was in, in in the past. Okay. Another question is, uh, do you have? <clears throat> pardon me. Do you have suggestions on database setup that may be need to be different because of using the database in Revit and then versus how you may have done things before in AutoCAD. Yeah, you know, the two separate database things um, fall into that line. If you have a separate duct and a separate piping, <coughs> you can't load two databases into the same Revit model. So that right there may cause you enough issues to where you don't want piping and, and duct work separate. Okay. <coughs> what else How do, do we you bring? And then, and then also button mappings. Uh, again, having some of those, uh, we found getting some items to come over properly, back and forth. Again, keeping your your design line set up as clean as possible. Okay. Next question here is: How do we bring a service into Revit? Well. Now you have the ability, I guess that's uh, that question, there's multiple 
not multiple steps, but there's a process now where um, I believe it was in 16, just when they added that functionality uh, with the Revit add-in, you have the ability now to load your database into Revit and then load the services accordingly. So now we can go back and, and, but you're limited at what you can do with that. I won't go into all of that, but yes, you can load the services in there. Um, and there's some documentation on that as well. I'm sure we can get a, a link to a video on that. Okay, all righty. Another gentleman here says, I'm not using EST for pipe, only duct. Can you clarify that not having cost info tables for all pipe items will not create an issue? I need to read that one again. Yeah, I got kind of lost on that. Whoop. Okay, he's wants know. to know he's, he's not using EST for pipe. He's only okay. using it for duct. Right. He wants to know if we can clarify that not having the cost info tables for all pipe items will that or will not will it not create an issue? The only issue it would create is if your company decided to start um, start estimating with it on the piping side. Uh, it just won't work because there's not the data there. Um, it doesn't take long to, to populate that data. And if nothing else, when, <clears throat> when you're building items, at, at least if you're not putting that data in, I'd keep a log of it so that if your company does decide uh, to switch over to EST, uh, then you know exactly what you need to um, to change in order to make that happen. And I would say at a minimum to that, because um, you may not have the costing data, but at a minimum, at least fill out your product information. That way, you know, that's just going to save a lot of time. Yeah, definitely. And the product information at a minimum get that in there. Next question is, what about different databases for long lead projects where updates would be stifled? Where updates would I, you got any idea how that applies, Lyle? No, not off the top of my head. All right, maybe that uh, Nate can add some things uh, later here. Next question is, uh, is there a best practices papers or videos? If not, that would be one to create. Um, one of the links I'm going to drop in the chat here is a link to a class that I did at AU, I want to say 2014, I don't know in the past years that was creating great fabrication services. So I kind of go over the process of, 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 create, of creating good services, not a step-by-step, -step, but more of a uh, workflow and, you know, overall recommendations. Yeah, best practices. Yeah. Yeah, yeah good idea. Is there any is there an easy way to find out what all pieces in the database have an incorrect connector so you can get go to all of the items and change them? Is there any is there an easy way to find out what all pieces in the database have an incorrect connector so you can go to all the items and change them? Scripting is just about your only way. And if you're not familiar with scripting, then um, you know that is something. If you're, yeah, if you're a client and uh, you have a support contract with us, we'd be more than happy to help you out with that. Um, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of things online on scripting. Um, and if you're not a client, please call us anyway. We can we'll try and and uh, do a discovery call and determine if we can assist you. Um, so, next question is: If you are using a project profile, do you have advice about getting the current costing data back into the profile once the global data has been changed? <laughs> oh, this is one of the things I've been kind of hammering apply or uh, 
Autodesk about. That's that's a change I want made to the software. That's a frustrating part on my point also. Um, as long as we're not making changes in both the profile, the global and the, the job specific profile, then it really can be as simple as copying a couple Mac files from your global profile in, into that and they will instantly be updated. Well, next time you start S or CAD or whatever you're pulling the numbers from. Um, the whole trick with that though is knowing which ones to move over. Um, but again, that's something that, that we can help with. Um, I wanna say it's F times, E times, and supplier. Cost, cost or supplier, yeah, one of those. Yeah. Out map. Yeah, so I think there's like four that you, right now that's that's how I'm handling it. It just, if I have one that I need to update a profile with current costing, then I'll just copy those files from, from the global profile. Okay. Um, if you're purging the database, what are some best practices on that? Well, First thing is heed the warning. As soon as you hit that purge database button, it's gonna say, it is strongly recommended that you back up your database. Um, so I don't know of a, uh, of a bigger warning in the software than that one right there. Definitely back it up, uh, make a copy somewhere. I have had issues when purging my database. Uh, I've had, strange issues. I've had every service have the wrong specification after I did a purge. I've had every service have the wrong hanger specification after a purge. So those are a couple things you want to check. Check your specs on this on your services, check your hanger specs on your services after doing a purge. Um, and if something isn't right, uh, if you've made a backup, then, then you'll be fine. Just restore your backup and um, you can either try it again or try it a little bit differently is even though. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. What's the best way to delete or rename reports? Best way, so when you create a report or you make it, as soon as you hit the new button, it asks you, you want to create a copy, yes or no. And as soon as you hit yes or no, it's either going to give you untitled or it's going to copy the name of the report. The very first thing I recommend doing is Click in there, type the name of the report, copy that name, and then hit the little floppy disk, and that's going to rename the file name to match, and you want to paste exactly what you name uh, the report. So that way it makes it easy to know what reports go to with what, and then if you're needing to delete those out, um, you know, if you're creating reports or, or testing re a new report, um, again, maybe rename it something that uh, you know if it, if you do uh, damage it or it explodes or something, you can just hit the delete button and it doesn't affect anything else and you don't carry that over from profile to profile. All right. Um, if we are missing costing on our ductwork items, such as oval library, do we have to create each costing in items or is there a database that we can go um, get for a standard? Well, the one we use is, is SMACNA. So SMACNA produces that and that is free to all SMACNA members. So if you can go to SMACNA website and do a search there and they, they have labor information for those things. Uh, if you're not a SMACNA member, then uh, I believe they, I don't know, they charge some money for it, a couple hundred bucks. I don't remember exactly what it was, but uh, you can still get that document. Um, there, there's probably others, um, but that's probably the most, uh, the most popular one. Alrighty. Next is, what is the best method to bring in other trades as external references without corrupting your database? Two methods. My very favorite method is a system that we set up when we set up a new client with our database and we set up what we call a master database up on the server and a working database on their local drive. When changes are made to the master, they simply sync down and it updates their working database. If you're doing that, then there are no worries. You're not 
connected to the master database. You won't make a mess of it. Um, and it, it just makes it so much easier to manage. Um, the, but barring that one, if you are working off your database that's sitting on the server and everybody, everybody's software is pointed to the server, then you must be very diligent about your permissions that um, standard users don't have permission to make changes. So when they open up a drawing and it brings all that stuff in, uh, as soon as they log out, it'll go away. But if they're in with full permissions as an administrator or in with full rights, then it doesn't go away. It stays there until somebody manually purges it out. So either have a working database or maintain your permissions very diligently and closely guard that password. Okay, if you have projects that require an older database version for three to four years and your other projects require the newer updates, what would be the best um, to keep these databases separate? Don't keep them separate. Okay. <laughs> not best to do that. Okay. Don't keep them separate. You do not need a separate database for every year of the software. I have been running the same database since 2013. Now, I'll give one warning with that. If I take my current database, which is most of the time is being accessed by the 2018 software, and I then open up something in 2014, you can expect issues when you go back that far. But for the most part, if you're no more than a year or two difference in software, which, you know, I don't know what situation where I'm, I have to use a different version of CAD, um, but... Um, yeah, he he mentioned going back three or four years, yeah. Yeah. Um, really, we'd have to find out why you think that that, that you need to do that. Because okay. the file for CAD has been the same from 2013 through 2017. Uh, it changed in 2018, but you can always save back. Now, Revit doesn't have that backward compatibility, but... Um, it still shouldn't affect um, your database unless you do have a Revit project that is all the way back to 14 and you have been making modifications in 18. Then we could have some issues that, that, I don't, that may be the one situation where there really is no choice, but I would, I, I would talk to us about it and, and or, or, or talk to someone else about it and make very sure that there are no other ways to handle that before you go making duplicate databases. All right. Is there an easy way we can convert a metric Revit model to be able to use an imperial fabrication database so we can use the design to fabrication button and not get sizing errors? Great question. Yeah, and it's got a two-letter ans answer. <laughs> no. You got anything comment to that, Lyle? No, I don't. That's the answer yeah. is no. No. The no. Well, um, I would have to say I was in a meeting earlier this week. Always, um, there's always the potential we could write software for a particular application. Uh, for, that is for, true. That is um, true. And. That is on a one-on-one -on -one basis. It's always a discovery call. So we're not, it isn't a part of our normal process. But if your company really needs it, and that is your client base is metric, let's explore a custom uh, solution for you. Um, so. Yeah, it would be worth kick, kicking it around to, to developers possibly and at least finding out, you know, what exactly that's going to be, you know? Right, I agree. Yeah. Are we talking about a hundred dollars or a hundred thousand dollars to solve this problem? Yeah, that's the real question. True. So, 
Um, okay, best practice for copying services and items from one database to another. If you have to do that, best practice, what I would recommend is having, uh, I always maintain a blank database that has nothing in it. So when I open up something in there, I can see what's coming in. And it's very obvious what's coming in. Um, so opening it up in, say, a working database, if you, if you got that kind of system set up, and then swapping out those materials and connectors. Um, you must be very careful, though, because there's so many different ways to build those connectors that you could be breaking the item in that process also. But it, we don't want duplicate connectors. And the way to avoid that is if you're going to bring something from an outside source, then bring it into uh, a temporary location, uh, temporary database or whatever. Make the changes there before it comes into your master and you have to clean it, then clean up the master. Because cleaning up the master later, it's hard to get in all the nooks and crannies of that uh, when you're cleaning that stuff out. And I'll, I'll add to that too, because there are certain things that once they're attached to the item, you can't change it to not set or none. So as Scott said, if you have a blank True. database, you can create a dummy materials, for instance, you, you could create one and call it none or delete me or something. So that way, when you do bring it over, it's bringing over something that's easily purged out that you can reference to. Yeah, good idea. All right, the next one is kind of long. So this person currently has a database that has many different materials type that was initially set up, such as each pipe material has its own group and then it's gauges under that group, rather than piping materials being in its own group with materials under that mm. and the gauges in their respective material. What would be the easiest way to fix this and change existing items to the proper material? There is no easy way. <laughs> Sorry, no staples easy button here. It's especially hard when you have ongoing projects and people working out of the database and you're trying to make changes like that. Uh, we went through it at Applied. We, we changed our materials, uh, almost exactly what you're talking about. Um, but we had an advantage. We didn't have people working out of it while we're trying to make those changes. Um, okay. Making the changes, then using scripting to make sure that you get uh, all of those materials onto the items, uh, checking your specifications to make sure that uh, if they're used in there, that they're, if they're tied into there, that just anywhere that that thing could be applied, that it gets changed. Um, and then it takes a lot of patience because they'll keep coming back until you get them all out. And um, it takes time. You're gonna have to be pretty committed if you wanna change all your materials. Okay. Next question uh, is using export SYS question mark. Not real sure what they mean. Yeah, uh, I guess I can only just assume on that on this one but yes that you'll need to be careful when importing or uh well exporting a service it's pretty that's a little bit more straightforward but if you're importing that um again and know what database you're importing that into what profile um because you could see uh, a bunch of different results there and understand what the prompts are asking you when to to bring them in Okay, next question, are reports and labels setting stored in the master database? Yes. And no. <laughs> I guess you can you can break, well, like printer settings, that depends, yeah. I guess. You can break, there's certain things you could break out um, and certain things that will stay in the database. As far as like custom printers, uh, that could be something you could set up individually for each user. And each right. report. Um, next question is, would I create uh, DB database issues by copying an item, 
and then in parentheses it says maintaining all the product info parentheses and rename the item file name for instance creating a bullhead t by swipe swapping the inlet and the outlet or should i create an entirely new item from scratch uh, in the bullhead t example everything would be the same so you wouldn't be harming anything by making a duplicate of that because it really is the same item it's the same order number it's the same map prod data it's it's all the same um, you are just swapping inlets and outlets but i will tell you you may want to try setting your service flow to none instead that's what we have done to avoid having to have all those bullhead t's because usually the bullhead t's you're setting those up so that um, they fill in design line at end of line t's um, try setting your service flow to none and you may not need that bullhead t